You're listening to Formosa Files. I'm Eric Michael Smith. I'm John Ross. So we're still in the World War II theater. Last time we got around to about 1944, we looked at the decision by the U.S. to invade the Philippines rather than Formosa. And we talked about a couple other things related to the war. But we kind of need to go back in time a bit and examine a pretty significant thing related to Taiwan that we didn't discuss last time. And that would be the prisoner of war camps on Taiwan. There were quite a few. There were 14 main camps and two temporary ones. From their establishment in about August 1942 to the end of the war, according to Japanese records, there were 4,344 Allied servicemen held as prisoners in those camps. Many more passed through the ports of, uh, in particular, Kaohsiung and Geelong, bigger ports of, of Taiwan. And most of the prisoners in the camps were not Americans, but rather British, Australians, and a few Dutch uh, soldiers mm -hmm. as well. The Taiwan History Podcast, Formosa Files, is made possible through the generous sponsorship of the Frank C. Chen Foundation. Formosa Files. Yes, uh, many of the British were from the fall of Hong Kong and Singapore in the early days of the war. Among those captured in Singapore was a Welshman called Jack Edwards, a sergeant in the Royal Corps of Signals. Towards the end of 42, Edwards and his comrades were uh, shipped up to the port of Geelong in March to a camp at Kinkaseki and put to work mining copper. Edwards would go on to write about the camps and what is the most famous of the Kinkaseki memoirs. Eric, can we say the title? Uh, it's, a, it's, it's not exactly the most polite title ever, but it's a historical work of, of note. And yes, I think uh, deserving to okay. be said. The book is titled... Bansai, you bastards. He earned the right to write that title. Let's put it that yeah. way. Mm -hmm. uh, the mine at uh, Kinkaseki was played out. It was on its last legs. So the mining work was especially arduous. Mm. They were digging far below the surface, squeezing out the last of the ore from the earth. Every day, the prisoners had to descend about 1,200 steps from the camp just to get to the mine itself, and then 2,000 more steps to get to their working areas. Okay, so 1,200 from the camp down to the mine, then 2,000 more. And then you've got to do that in reverse, obviously, yeah. at the the end of an exhausting day's work. Mm. And we're talking mining here by hand, which is obviously dangerous and filthy work. And mm -hmm. then you got to tack on starvation rations. And as we know from the book that you just mentioned and several other uh, accounts, um, sadistic guards yeah. and commanders there. Yeah, the guards took every opportunity to beat prisoners. So whenever prisoners saw or went past camp personnel, even the lowest ranked Taiwanese guards, they had to stand to attention and bow. And failure to do this quickly enough or to the guards' satisfaction resulted in a beating. This could be like a slap, a punch, or you could be beaten unconscious with a rifle butt. The more sadistic guards took pleasure in catching the POWs out by rushing into their huts uh, so they wouldn't have time to come to attention and bow. Beatings were given out for offenses as trivial as lying down in bed before the official nine o'clock lights out. So we're talking about hellish conditions here for the POWs and no hope of rescue for the most part or escape. And not really anybody tried, did they? Not that I know of. I think two broke out off a camp in Taichung. The two prisoners were caught very quickly, tortured, made to dig their own graves and beheaded. Wow, harsh. And not only was that horrible for them, but of course that would have added to the misery of the, the other POWs in the camp because there would have been collective punishment, yeah. Yes. Uh, going back to Kinkaseki and uh, POW Edwards, he says that what lifted their spirits was seeing bombing raids. The first sighting of American fighter bombers in October 1944. That really gave them hope. Yeah, seeing planes would be the first definite sign that things are changing, that the war had turned. And yeah, you're seeing American planes, you know, Japan's on the back foot. That's a morale booster. And it must have felt pretty awesome as a bit of retribution as well. Yes. Uh, he wrote in his book that the prisoners felt that the planes were hitting back for them. And uh, every bomb dropped was a, a blow in retaliation for uh, all their persecution. 
Speaking of blows, um, we know that Taiwan took an absolute pounding in late 1944 and all through the summer of 1945, actually. And they really only yeah. stopped bombing because there wasn't anything left to bomb. Mm. And we're talking about this is American planes from from carriers that were off the coast, but also heavy bombers that flew out of the Philippines because America had now retaken many parts of it. Right. So planes were hitting the obvious targets that you would think of in Taiwan, the port the railways, airstrips, airports. There are about 50 airports in Taiwan, big and small. Factories, of course, power plants. If you think about power plants, that means that most of the cities in Taiwan were without power for all of the summer of 1945, or roughly most mm -hmm. of it. And then sugar factories. There were 30-odd sugar refineries on the island that were also hit hard. Yes, uh, sugar refineries were a prime target. They'd been converted to making an alcohol called butanol. Uh, it's used for aviation fuel, so. So they wanted uh, to hit those. Yeah. And you were also telling me before we started recording something about uh, Taiwan getting bombed by planes from China. Yes. Uh, I only found this out recently. Uh, Americans are flying their massive B-29s, you know, the Boeing 29 Super Fortress. These are high altitude, long range, massive payloads, like something out of the future. They were flying from Chengdu, Sichuan province in the far west of China. I mean, that's mm. uh, 1,800 kilometers away. Amazing. And uh, the the first attack on Taiwan, I think, was uh, October 14th, 44, a massive raid, a hundred, just over a hundred B-29s with the target Okayama. Okayama. So that would be today's Gangshan. And that's uh, just kind of in the north part of uh, what's today Kaohsiung City. It used to be a, mm -hmm. a little city in its own right. There was an airbase there during the Japanese period that uh, had plane assembly and there was also a repair factory, but there's still a base there today mm -hmm. operated by the ROC Air Force. So on the 9th of January, the Americans, they first had secured other islands in the Philippines, invaded Luzon. That's the main island and the home to the capital of Manila. And as mm -hmm. part of that operation, they had to bomb targets in Taiwan, including where I happen to live, the port of Kaohsiung. And it was a very fateful day for hundreds of prisoners of war who were passing through Kaohsiung. Kaohsiung has always been a transit hub, and during the war, it was an important uh, transit hub for POWs. They were taken from various places in Asia and then shipped north to like Japan or Korea or Manchuria. Okay, you, you're referring to the aptly named hell ships, right? Yeah, yeah, hell ships. Those were the ships transporting POWs. So most of the ships were needed for military operations, so they're not going to be giving the best ships to POWs. They're using right. dilapidated old ships and they packed them in in just horrific conditions. They were called hell ships. They were death traps. Many prisoners died on the way from horrible conditions and they were buried at sea, if you want to put it uh, that way. And plenty of ships were hit by American bombing and torpedoes. Yes. And reaching port was no guarantee of safety, was it? No. As noted, Kaohsiung was a much used repair stop for ships. The POWs were usually just kept um, on board below the deck right? So should a bombing raid occur and your stuff below decks, it's, it's not good. Okay. And the 9th of January, 1945 is a very famous date, unfortunately, for, for the people on the Enorumaru. That was a Japanese cargo ship docked at the port of Takao or Kaohsiung. It got hit and uh, around 350 POWs died. The ship mm. didn't sink, but it was put out of action and the remains of the dead were buried in this mass grave on what we call Chijing Island today. But uh, in 1946, after the war, the Americans took the remains off of Chijing Island and uh, they were reburied in uh, communal graves in Hawaii. I've read about those Hal ships, uh, that particular one. Inora Maru, that story is actually much worse than what you just outlined. Uh, you're, you're talking about how they had already survived a, a sinking, yeah? Yeah. 1,600 survivors of the Bataan Death March, Corregidor, and uh, other battle sites. They'd uh, boarded this other ship, uh, but soon after, to leave in Manila, it was bombed by American planes. Uh, almost 300 died. Uh, it's it's bad enough when you die a, a hero's death, but it just seems worse to be accidentally killed by your own side. 
Yeah. So these survivors, they got on that uh, Inura, how do you say? Inura Maru. And uh, a smaller one, uh, the Brazil Maru. Right. And after the Kaohsiung attack, the survivors from the bombing were transferred to the one you mentioned, the Brazil Maru. And they mm-hmm. finally sailed for Japan, but an estimated 500 died aboard the Brazil Maru during that two-week voyage for Japan. That's a shocking fatality rate. It really is. The largest loss of American POWs uh, in the entire Second World War. It's actually on a transport ship headed to Kaohsiung, a ship called the Arisan Maru. Does that name mean anything to you? Arisan would be named after Ali Shan, Mount Mm -hmm. Ali. We've already noted that the Japanese uh, named some of their their stuff off of mountains in Taiwan. So Ali Shan is that beautiful scenic spot not too far from where you live Mm -hmm. in Jai. And of course, Maru, anybody who's seen a Japanese ship will probably notice that the the last part of the name is Maru on almost every ship I can think of. And it's it's just a thing to bring good luck. Yes. The Arisan Maru was in a convoy from the Philippines, October 44, and it ran into one of the largest concentrations of submarines that had been there. The area between Luzon and Formosa was deadly. The Arisan was torpedoed by an American sub, damaged, it didn't sink immediately. Japanese survivors were picked up by Japanese escort destroyers, but the POWs left. Mm. The ship sank, and after a few days in the rough seas clinging on to floating debris, just nine survivors, four recaptured, five escaped and made their way to China in a lifeboat. They met up with some uh, Chinese guerrillas on the coast and helped them to uh, U.S. forces in the southwest. Do we happen to know if uh, there was any respect given whatsoever to the concept of POW uh, ships? Did you know you put a cross on it or somehow indicate that it's a POW ship? Well, yes, but the Japanese tended not to mark their POW ships, but would mark other ones with more vital supplies. Okay. The, the convention is supposed to be that you're supposed to mark it and then other people will be respectful of it. So uh, you said it was the most deadly slaughter of POWs mm-hmm. during the Second World War. How many POWs were on the Arishan Maru? Oh, sorry, I forgot to say. Uh, it was 1,782 POWs. Wow. Mostly Americans from camps all across Luzon. That's a, a couple hundred more than died in the sinking of the Titanic. That's a huge amount, almost 1,800 people. Yeah. Wow. So we're, we're moving now into 1945. And from our hindsight, we can see that, you know, the war is clearly coming to a close. Americans are dominating the waters around Taiwan with their submarines, and they're pretty much bombing Taiwan at will. So I didn't know this until recently, but the Japanese didn't have what you would call officially an air force. They had the army air forces and the Navy air mm. forces, and both of them you know, had planes and stuff, but not the exactly the same divisions as you might see in, in other militaries. And we saw last time in our last podcast that there was huge losses uh, taken by the Japanese during the Taiwan air battle and also that mm. battle for Leyte Gulf. And it was such a destructive mauling that the Japanese were desperate enough to begin starting suicide attacks. So what are the Japanese, what's the plan here? Well, they're uh, retreating from the Philippines to Taiwan and they bring the remains of their air fleets to Taiwan. Admiral Onishi of the Japanese Imperial Navy's first air fleet, often called the father of the kamikaze, the suicide bombers, he evacuates the northern Philippines and sets about uh, assembling a kamikaze unit, combining veterans and young pilots, green pilots. Now, he, he's credited as being the father of these kamikaze units. He'd done this a little nor- in the northern Philippines, and then he's forming a suicide unit on Formosa. It's called the Nitaka Unit. Formed in Tainan on January 18, there was a ceremony, a special meal. Uh, the Admiral gave words of praise and encouragement, poured the men some sake. So you said the Nitaka unit, and as we know, that was named after Jade Mountain. Uh, people will remember the, uh, perhaps remember the famous line, uh, climb Mount Nitaka, the order to attack uh, on Pearl Harbor. Yes. So three days after this uh, Nitaka unit formed, Onishi put his unit to the test as an American task force was reported nearing Formosa. There were uh, several small groups of planes, Mitsubishi Zeros as escorts and Suisei carrier dive bombers 
as the attackers. Some of the zeros were suicide planes too. So it's a clear winter's morning, 17 aircraft go up, seven escorts and 10 on a one-way mission. The American Third Fleet were about 200 miles to the southeast of Taiwan, a huge force, several hundred planes, you know, dive bombers, fighters, torpedo bombers. They're looking to hit southern Taiwan and they do. Tainan, Kaohsiung, they inflict great damage. But meanwhile, the Nitaka unit are nearing the fleet. Hellcat fighters try to take care of them, but four kamikaze make it through and hit ships. Two dived into the fleet carrier. Another suicide pilot struck a light carrier and a fourth hit the destroyer. The light carrier could be repaired, but the other two uh, were put out of action. Three hours after they had taken off, six of the seven zero escorts arrived home in Tainan. They're heady from the rush of combat, the success of their first mission. <laughs> and no doubt the, the thrill of being uh, still alive. So yeah. this flight out of Tainan was not the first time that the Japanese had come up with the idea of kamikaze fighters. Correct. So when the Americans saw these planes coming on that uh, January morning, were they expecting that some of these would be kamikaze fighters? Yes. Mm. So it's it's fair to say that that particular mission was a, a pretty decent success if you're looking at it from a military perspective. So it also would make sense that from then on, the Japanese, if they don't have a lot of other options, options, they're going to focus on kamikaze raids. And this whole suicide plane thing reaches a zenith in the Battle of Okinawa. The Imperial Japanese Navy Air Force and the Army Air Force, they deployed just pretty much all their last planes for Okinawa. Mm -hmm. So that's the Battle of Okinawa, April and May, basically. April and May of 45, uh, the American attack force at Okinawa, they're going to see huge waves of kamikazes. In total, over those two months, 1,400 aircraft looking to strike ships. Of course, they, they want to hit carriers especially, don't they, and destroyers. Mm. On the 6th and the 7th of April, more than 650 aircraft, half of them suicide planes, targeted the Americans. Almost 400 of the 650 were shot down, but of course, many broke through, sinking six ships, I think, damaged about 20. Okay, so during the Battle of Okinawa, um, there were some, some warships, American and warships of all different classes that were damaged, some sunk, but they did not manage to get an aircraft carrier or any battleship. So that would be considered a failure. And a lot of this has to do with, with pilot quality. Yeah, uh, not that good by this stage. The ones taking off from uh, Taiwan, they uh, flew during the day so they knew that they could see where they were going, um, mm. timed it so they arrived uh, with sunset. Yeah, they didn't bag any um, real prizes in terms of the ships that they sunk. In contrast, the Americans sank on April 7th, the world's largest battleship, the Yamato. It was on its own suicide run, no aerial cover. So you've got what, like two months, the Battle of Okinawa is, is ongoing and you've got planes, kamikaze attacks coming from Formosa and then a lot from Kyushu, the southern mm -hmm. island of Japan. Yes, a lot of planes in Taiwan had been destroyed on the ground, so the majority of planes were coming from Kyushu. Perhaps a fifth or a quarter were from northern Taiwan. And of course, northern Taiwan is getting pounded in return. There's not a whole bunch of resistance. The Japanese didn't have any planes left they could really defend the island with. Yes. So the US suffered light losses uh, while bombing. Uh, they still had some planes shot down by uh, anti-aircraft guns or mechanical failures. Some prisoners taken they were not considered, not treated as POWs, but rather war criminals. They were uh, kept in the old uh, Taipei prison, appalling conditions and badly treated. And on May 29th, 1945, a mock trial was held for 14 of these airmen, and they were sentenced to death. On the morning of June 19th, those 14 American airmen were executed by a Japanese firing squad. Two days after the trial, the gods of war sent a terrible retribution. And you're talking about by far the deadliest single air attack on Taipei. That would be the 31st of May, 1945, mm -hmm. known in history books as the Taihoku Air Raid. We're talking about 117 B-24 Liberator heavy bombers. 
and 3,000 or more people died, tens mm -hmm. of thousands displaced and homeless in an already damaged city. This is all part of the ongoing American conquest of Okinawa, Operation Iceberg. And you told me there were New Zealand aviators involved in Operation Iceberg, and they attacked Taiwan. Yes, they were part of the British Pacific Fleet, uh, assigned the task of uh, neutralizing the Japanese airfields on the islands south of Okinawa, from Okinawa down to uh, airfields in northern Formosa. Mm. We don't think so much of the British uh, in the Pacific at this point in the war. Uh, the British have been in the war longer than the Americans and the Soviets. They've been there since 39, standing alone. The country is, is broke, and they didn't have a lot of success in the Pacific. So why were they getting involved at this Stage. To regain lost prestige, uh, humiliating losses, uh, fall of Singapore, right. Hong Kong, elsewhere. You can't just come back and say, yeah, uh, your old uh, imperial rulers are here. You can't do that on the coattails of the Americans. You need to earn the right to rule your colonies once more. Right. And you also said that the Kiwis were overrepresented. Why would there be so many of them? We've got a proud aviation tradition going all the way back to the first Howard Flight. Uh, mm. Who's normally credited with that honor? Uh, the Wright brothers are not New Zealanders. They are <laughs> from a place called Kitty Hawk in North Carolina, and the first flight was in 1903 in all North right. Carolina. If you uh, ask a New Zealander that question, then they all say uh, what you just said, but they may tag on, but maybe it was that Richard Pierce flight down in Tamuka, Canterbury Way. Uh, you've you've okay, got me. Right. I'm lost. Richard Pierce, a young farmer and brilliant inventor, your textbook mad genius. Yes, he would end up in a nut house, but anyway. Um, <laughs> he built a contraption uh, looking a bit like a modern microlite. Among his earlier inventions was a bicycle with a bamboo frame. Lessons learned from that, which he applied to his flying machine. Okay, that's interesting. The Wright brothers also came to aviation out of cycling. They had a bicycle store, right? So mm -hmm. did he actually fly? Yes. You guys need to be more assertive in your claims of, you know, like uh, we were the first. America, we, we just say we did it. So, you know, we, we did. Okay. Uh, let's just say it's um, controversial. <laughs> okay. There's, there's a, a practical reason why there were a lot of New Zealanders in the uh, British Pacific fleet. If you were an aspiring pilot in New Zealand at that time, you could enlist in the British uh, Royal Navy. They had an office in New Zealand. Or if you wanted to join the British RAF, the Royal Air Force, no office in, in, in New Zealand. So you'd have to go uh, overseas to join. And one notable pilot, a young man called Don Cameron, Cameron joined when he was 19, shot down over Italy in 43, captured by German, a German panzer division. After 10 days, he managed to escape and return to Allied lines. Now, in 1945, he was flying a Corsair. That's an American fighter. He's uh, off. He's working off the HMS Victorious uh, carrier. He's with the British Pacific Fleet, 23 years old now, shot down over Ishigaki Island on May 9th, captured. He's taken to Taipei. This, this dude has a really impeccable timing, um, and it's uh, yeah, hard to say whether he's really lucky or unlucky, but timing, wow. Yeah, he's there for some uh, heavy-duty U.S. bombing raids, and mm -hmm. um, during during a raid, he uh, makes his escape through a hole in the prison building roof, makes his way down a river, spends a cold night in a field, uncovered the next morning by soldiers, transferred to the Japanese Imperial Navy's interrogation camp in Japan, but he survived the war, uh, one of the few New New Zealanders to have been a prisoner of both the Germans and the Japanese. Well, I guess I'm going to have to come down on the side of lucky. Um, New Zealand involvement is a little surprising to some people, but in the last podcast, you also mentioned aviators from Mexico, which was even more surprising. The 201st Mexican Fighter Squadron with the brilliant nickname, the Aztec Eagles. Yeah, that's great. And I did yeah. read that article you sent me, another mm -hmm. in that series from the Taipei Times newspapers, Taiwan in Time. They've got that great to a weekly series. And in the article, it says that Mexico was reluctant to join the war, but after two Mexican oil tankers were sunk, they decided to declare war on the Axis powers in 1942. And part of the contribution to the war effort was a 300-strong volunteer force. Yes. Uh, might be worth reminding people that that's not 300 pilots. Uh, that's a total number. So we've got mechanics, cooks, uh, so on. Right. And following training in the U.S., 
U.S. They go to Luzon in the Philippines. After some more training alongside Americans, the Aztec Eagles, or 201st, saw action in Luzon, bombing and uh, ground support. Yeah, their Taiwan missions came rather late. July of 45, they did several uh, recon sweeps off Taiwan. Saw Japanese aircraft, but there were no engagements. But the Taipei Times article does note that on August 8th, the Aztec Eagles flew to Taiwan again, this time for a bombing mission on Hualien. Then it was known by the Japanese name of Karenko. They had six 1,000-pound bombs, and they dropped them, but they appear to have missed their targets. I'm happy they missed. Uh, Consider that date, August 8, two days after Hiroshima, one before Nagasaki, and exactly a week before Hirohito publicly announced surrender, unconditional surrender. I I know destruction and death are tragic, no matter the timing, but uh, when you're at the very, very end of a conflict, the last days, well... Yeah, you don't want to be the the guy who kills the, the last enemy soldiers, really, unnecessarily. Early, and you also don't want to be the last person to buy the farm. Except uh, if you're some kind of uh, diehard hawk. You you remember your Climb Mount Nitaka coded message uh, from the last episode? Yep. The message saying, proceed to attack Pearl Harbor. I did some Googling and the commander likely behind the message was the last kamikaze. The last kamikaze. Okay. Admiral Matome Ugaki. And after hearing the surrender radio message, he wrote, uh, he wrote an entry in his diary, climbed into his dive bomber and headed for Okinawa shot down by ground fire. And Onishi, the man who's considered the father of uh, the Kamikaze units, he founded the Nitaka unit on Formosa. In Tainan. He, in Tainan, he committed uh, seppuku the next day. Oh, that ritual suicide. uh, Very Mm. unpleasant. Yeah. But um, on Taiwan, there was no mass outbreaks of ritual suicide. Thankfully, it was a rather sedate ending. The Japanese surrendered quietly to arriving Americans and POWs are evacuated. Yes, a nice, quiet ending and a sudden one thanks to the atomic bombs and also the Soviet advance towards Japan. The Japanese didn't have time to carry out their orders issued from the the war ministry in Tokyo to kill all remaining POWs. Mm. Uh, And we even have a uh, execution order which the Japanese failed to uh, destroy in Taiwan. That's uh, very happy news because seriously, enough men had died. The death count from the camps is about 430, and the majority of those deaths from the one that you mentioned early on in northern Taiwan, Kinkaseki. And this is not counting the deaths uh, in the following months and years from uh, the effects of imprisonment. Right. Um, there's a, a wonderful organization in Taiwan led by uh, a fellow named Michael Hurst. They have a a POW commemoration event every year. They try to, uh, the ones that are are still alive have made visits to Taiwan on some occasions. Sometimes they've even met with their former Taiwanese guards. And you can look up POW Society of Taiwan and and if you're interested in that. Uh, He's just published a book on uh, POW experience in Taiwan. Yes. And uh, as you noted, unfortunately, the events of wars cause chaos and suffering for a very, very long time after they're officially closed. And we're going to examine that in our next podcast as we finish off the World War II story or get close to finishing it. Yes. Apologies for this episode. We didn't really feature many Taiwanese, did we? Uh, They're mostly just uh, uh, as targets of uh, bombs. But next week, uh, we'll feature a very interesting uh, Taiwanese chat. You've been listening to Formosa Files, and thanks for listening. I'm Eric Michael Smith. I'm John Russ. Catch you next time. Bye.